This is the Amp Hour Podcast, recorded August 25th, 2015, episode 264, The Cost of Doing Business. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Dave Jones from the EEV blog. And I'm Chris Gamble of Chris... <laughs> no, no. You do it yeah, again. Yeah, that no. bloke is on every week. Yeah, no, that's it. That's it. Mm-hmm. We agreed that we're not wasting another second. And, and I'm Chris going. Gamble of Contextual Electronics. <laughs> he screwed up the intro. <laughs> Professional podcaster. Nah. Far from it. Far Coming from it. Coming to you from a hack, hacked up setup in downtown Pasadena. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on a cell phone uh, and then recording separately. And uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Technology. Dodgy ads, folks. Yeah. Can't trust Wi Fi. Yeah. You know, like. Oh, Wi Fi is a- shit. Ho- the hotel Wi Fi is a whole nother level of shittiness above regular shitty Wi Fi. Yeah. Like, for some reason, Wi Fi is like the ultimate shit. I don't understand why. Um, probably because, I mean, it's optimized for different things, right? At least I think these days optimi- it's optimized for like streaming Netflix and stuff like that. It's not, it's never going to be like, oh, quick ping and deterministic type Hang stuff. On, Obviously, streaming Netflix? Nobody's going to stream Netflix via Wi-Fi in a hotel room. They come in via the cable so that they can charge you whatever, right? No, not me, man. Really? You watch cable? Yeah, I don't watch cable. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. No, no. But I, I think that that's, uh, you know, a lot of people don't think about that, you know, in a lot of situations, you know, like thinking about non-deterministic communication, stuff like that. Like, like I see some some things that are coming out with like Bluetooth low energy on them and you're like, how how are they going to possibly have the bandwidth they need for, for their well, applications? Yeah. I mean, like. It's Bluetooth yes. low energy, right? It's, it's a pissy little. Yeah. I no, mean, some people are pushing it. Some people push it to. to really? Yeah. 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 What, to, like, uh, broadcast quality audio? Uh, I don't say that, but what's broadcast quality, <laughs> right. like, 320 oh, kilobit? Well, I mean, yeah, like, something like that. And, well, that's MP3, right? So, you yeah. know, wash your mouth out kind of thing. But, uh, oh. no, it would be, you know, at least, you know, 44.1 kilohertz, you know, CD quality kind of streaming. Uh, yeah, I think you're... Aren't you confusing the bit rate with the? Uh, I actually don't even know <laughs> the bit rate with the uh, the frequency content and stuff like that. Kilohertz versus kilobit oh, well, per second. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're talking about you know you want a good solid twenty kilohertz bandwidth, right? You want you know proper amp, you know proper audio full on bandwidth, which requires to get your twenty kilohertz. Or, you know it requires your forty four point one kilohertz CD, uh, CD sample rate, CD uh, bit rate. Yeah, I guess I'm I'm talking about the the encoding and stuff like that. Anyways, uh, for transmission, no, I don't even I don't even know. Uh, but oh, because uh, yes, because <laughs> duh, because you know uh, Wi-Fi is like bits per second, right. not bytes. <laughs> yeah, or samples. Not yeah, analog. one sample could be you know like uh, yeah, like you know CD quality is sixteen bit sampling at forty four point one k, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you right, know right, that right. translates into yeah, you got to multiply them to get your bit rate. Duh. Right. I'm sure we right. know what we're actually talking about. Yeah, you know, I'm starting to get into audio stuff for uh, textual electronics, and I'm I'm a little I'm a little worried because first off, Why? we had like I thought you were an audio guy. Well, I say I'm an analog I guy, you're but a that's muso. oh, like that. But no, that's the thing. I'm never, like we talked about that last week with Fran. Like you know, like I don't really do an, uh, audio stuff. I've done a little bit, but not not much. So it's kind of one of those learning as I go kind of things, you know. All right. So. Hmm. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> I mean, like it's a lot of the a lot of the base. Like it's like one of those things where it's like you know you're on the edge of what you know, and like I know transistor theory, and I can synthesize information from a lot of sources. Like there's a lot of great sources out there online, but I think that one of the one of the skills these days is being able to like you know take the information you find online. It's always been this, I guess, but you know take that information you find online, and it's about how quickly you synthesize that into. Right. Know, usable, yeah. usable output. So, 
Got it. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yeah. uh, right, what do we got this week? It seems like it's all bloody hardware startup. Yeah, talk. Every there was second a second link stuff. seems to be. Yeah. There's a ton of it. Well, one one interesting one which I added, which um, I, I thought was... <laughs> oh, well, um, let's go right to that. Yes, of Well, course. let's go straight to that, because I don't add many things to the list, so why right, not? Right, right, right. Uh, Chris has been keeping an eye on this all week, but Dave happened to uh, <laughs> trip, stumble, and, the and, last minute. Yeah. and fall on top of a story that may or may not be relevant, so let's find out. <laughs> anyway, this comes from... Um, I, actually, I don't know what website it is. Sorry, it's imre.net or something. Clicky... Uh, clickety-click blog or something. Anyway, the title is, Is There an Uncanny Valley for Hardware Projects? And you may not have heard the term, but I hadn't heard the term before, but I know what the term is. Yeah. Uncanny Valley? This is a total misapplication of a term. I mean, it, <laughs> right. The uncanny valley refers to ro- robots and how, as they get increasingly more human-like, See, they fall no, off. I, I've I've never heard that. I've never heard that term. If you look at any like have. humanoid robot, you're going to find someone talking about the uncanny valley because eventually someone goes, Ugh. "Well, no, sorry. <laughs> well, okay, f- fine. Yeah, that's where it comes from. That's what it says here. But I've never heard of it. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. So, right. okay. And yeah, it comes from yeah. The more you know, the more human. They get there's a little graph here, you know. It basically uh, talks about um, how and how it relates to hardware projects. In that, the more you try and make your project professional looking, right? There's a point where if you're just before, you know, if you're just below professional looking, then it's not going to be very appealing to people. So you either got to go full on full Monty professional or mm-hmm. you've got to go amateur, right? There's like... I don't agree, <laughs> so I don't agree this with graph. this at all. I don't agree well, with this I, at all. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the... Well, that's what we're here to talk about, right? I'll, give, I'll show you. I'll explain the graph. It starts out at zero, right? And this is the professional execution on the x-axis versus the satisfaction on the y-axis. So picture, you know, wave your hands around and picture this, folks. Okay, so it starts out your breadboard prototype, right? That's probably like the least professional execution you can have, okay? And people's satisfaction with that is like, like not very exciting at all, right? (laughs) As, As, you know, if you publish your, you know, or sell your, try and sell your project on a breadboard or, you know, publish it on a breadboard, eh, people are going to go, you know, it's a breadboard. But you put it on a pre-CB prototype, Hey, you know, people's satisfaction rating goes up. Hey, it's on a PCB. Beautiful. It's at least starting to be professional, right? <laughs> and then and then you move and then and then the graph goes up as you reach a fully documented project. You know, you've got this, you know, you've got a blog page with all the information. It's all there, all your bill of materials, your schematic, your theory of operation, blah blah blah, right? Everything's there. Fully documented project. Every is people's satisfaction is absolutely huge. Right, people go, wow, that's a well executed professional project. Okay? And then you get and then it sort of then it falls off a cliff into this uncanny valley. And your satisfaction actually goes negative at this point. And they and they give a few examples of why. Um, when a gadget uh, moves, you know, when your product moves to surface mount components, for ex- for example, but they're hand soldered. Okay, so you've tried to be professional by going all surface mount and, you know, everything, but you've just hand sold them and it looks all dodgy, right? That's there, you know, that's that where you're trying too hard to be professional, but you've screwed it up and it just looks dodgy as. That's actually worse, apparently, in the satisfaction I, rating I don't, than... I'm sorry, I don't agree with this You don't agree. You don't agree. Who, anyway, who cares? Well, who's... who's... <laughs> I don't know. Like, okay, so who's the arbiter of satisfaction, right? Well, yeah. I mean, like, I guess if you're selling all these things, but like, fully documented project and and hand soldered, like all like hand soldered components. These things are not mutually exclusive. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'd say exactly. I'd say like if you if you're getting to the point where it's like, oh, it has a case, but it's three D printed. Okay, yeah, sure, that's dodgy. But like, I'd put all that stuff before. I, I don't. I don't. I think this is right. just a this is yeah. just a, a I, clickbait title, unfortunately. I I, a I do agree. Clickbait title. I've been suckered in. I, you I totally have. I've got to admit, I have. Well, you know, like yeah. But, all right. But I I do have some relevant data points here. So I was helping judge the okay. the, the early stuff for the Hackaday Prize. Uh, right. So the the product. As in side the of latest things. one. 
the the first round. Yeah, I help. I always I help with the first round last year. Okay. Yeah, I'm one of the silent judges. Not so silent. Okay, uh, <laughs> but you're talking about the current contest. Oh yeah, yeah, the like, 2015. Yeah, no. so there's a product that's tracked this year, and I got to take a look at some of the early stuff, the early products and stuff like that. And I mean, that's what it is. It's like you know, it's a product they had to actually send in hardware this year versus last year. You know, if it wasn't a product, it it was different. But you know, when you hear product, you're like, oh well. It's done. You know what I mean? Like, but it's right. Yeah, yeah. It it should be a product. It's yeah. Right, and and so that's what, the definition what, of the word. A product is a commercial product. Right, it and, should be and, polished and finished. Right, and obviously we've had arguments about out of box experience here, but you know, like there are certain things you expect. Like it has a case, it has packaging, it has it has a note at least with a a link to some startup documentation online, that kind of thing. Like, yeah, I mean, right. there, there, that is a that's a fit and finish type of thing. And I do agree that that's difficult, but I'm not sure that it falls off where it's like, oh, I got a PCB. And then, you know, like, I, I, I don't know. Like, I, I don't agree that. Yeah, that... I, no, I think it's exaggerated. I, I can see their point. I can understand their point. I just don't, I think the graph is highly I think that get, getting from getting from a Tindy board to Dave complaining about, uh, uh, you know, a, a finished watch not having perfect firmware on it yeah okay sure there's a there's a lot of steps in between there and there's a lot of dave complaining in there but let's be honest folks there's a lot of dave complaining everywhere so <laughs> so uh, but I, oh I, I, my goodness what i will uh, what i will agree with is that you know having you know like especially like as as people obviously there's a lot of this maker pro kind of people moving into other areas and trying to sell products and stuff like that a case alone you know having a custom case doesn't have to be oh, custom makes, molded anything yeah. like that but like yeah even just a you know a custom 3d printed hand polished kind of painted case like that adds a lot to a project like no doubt that about that adds a world of difference yeah totally yeah, yeah i mean like like having light pipes in a in a case versus just having right. leds sticking out right. or having yeah you yeah know, just yeah. leds trying to shine through something yeah that that makes a uh, that's a that's a big difference uh, having having silk screening on plastic having silk having good silk screening on a board like those are like the you know that, that's like that last 10 percent type of thing sure yeah i'll give you that that yep. that that makes a big difference in a project but i don't think that it it doesn't fall off from that <laughs> from 80 <laughs> right from no, 80 to 90 percent done it's not like much. it's yeah it's not yeah, like yeah. it's nothing so yeah. so yeah mm. i don't know i don't know tell us folks would you be you know, if you're expecting a real polished product and you get something that has, you know... Well, no, I can see... No, actually, now that I think about it, I can kind of see their point, right? If I paid for a professional product, right? Okay, well, let's, and let's, let's, let's use a con- and, and, let's use a and concrete example here. Up. Hang on. No, 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 let's, let's, use, let's use the microcurrent as an example. I think that's that's fair, right? Oh no, because it's not a consumer product. No, 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 not, not no, consumer. No. We're not talking about consumer. No, are we? I, no, I wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. It says commercial, I, I think not we consumer. Are. You, you're trying to push it. Well, you're trying to push it to general pu- Joe public, you know, right? As opposed to selling specifically to engineers who understand stuff, right? Mm, maybe anything yeah. is sold to the general. My microcurrent doesn't sell to the general public, really, right? Okay, it sells sure. to electronics enthusiasts, hobbyists, engineers, right? It's different. No, but it just, you know, like if you bought a Wi-Fi router, right, or something, I don't know, and, and you open it up, right, if you went to the shop and you bought it and you open it up and all the components were hand-soldered, <laughs> all the okay. SMD parts were hand-soldered, you'd have a pretty low satisfaction rating, almost negative satisfaction rating of that product, right? Yeah, but this is, so that I would, think, I think if, that's if you're what they're following this, about. No, because if you're following this curve, then you're saying at some point if it was just a, a Wi-Fi router board – and it was just a prototype, then you would be somewhat satisfied. And I don't That's agree with that. That's what they're saying because you no. don't ex- because your expectations aren't as high when it's just a sort of you're not know, an amateurish project. Once you make that leap to full on professional consumer bought off the shelf, the expectation for it to be perfect in you know, not not every way, but at least professionally executed is much higher. And then if it's not, and you get all your hand-soldered compo- SMD components, or it's got bodge wires all over it, right? Okay. You're gonna, your satisfaction is going to be pretty low. Hmm. My satisfaction is pretty low with this conversation. With this article. <laughs> okay. Well, there you go. Uh, anyway, they, they, they've they tried to equate it to the Uncanny Valley in robotics. So, mm, yeah. I don't know. Mm, kind mm. of 
Yeah. Yeah. Next. <sighs> yeah. Hey, Altium. <laughs> yeah. I have, yeah. Uh, Altium yeah. bought. Um. Two people. Octopart. That's right. Congratulations <laughs> to them. And uh, also Siva, who's another uh, bomb tool company. Well, kind of more like manufacturing. And I will state oh, up front. Oh, did they buy them too? Yeah, they did. I will state up front that I am a little bit biased on this stuff because I work on similar products, so people should keep that in mind. Uh, but right. I know the I Octopart I, uh, folks, and, and they're yeah. great, so glad to hear yeah, that, that. This happened quite a few months ago, apparently. Um, but it's only, yeah. What? Well, no, how, it, well, it came out a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, it just it just news announced. public anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So... Yes, um, and no surprises whatsoever. I did a blog post ages ago. Um, yeah, I was. I forgot fact, about that. Back on sep- September fifth, it's a year ago now. Mm-hmm. September fifth, a year ago, um, I did a blog post uh, entitled "Who is Altium Buying?" And um, yeah, I, I'm surprised it took them this long to actually buy someone. Um, but what, I think what, that was one of my. Um, what was the you prompting for something? that? What was the prompting for the that art? I don't uh, remember. That the prompting article. was is that Altium for the first time since they floated, i.e., like first time in fifteen years or something, they took capital, um, external capital. They they uh, got um, uh, what was it? Um, yeah, they raised some capital. They raised yeah, which which they didn't have to. This is a company that's in great financial shape has no debt tons of cash in the bank they didn't need to raise capital so the at at the time i questioned well the only reason that they'd raise capital is so that they could buy somebody oh you're um, saying like they would have been fine just on their own like just, just oh they'll be fine just on their yeah, own yeah, they along, could have right. made small acquisitions even with the cash they had on hand um so it was very puzzling that they actually uh got money mm-hmm. that they actually raised raised capital at the time that was a year ago so yeah. I can't remember how I don't even don't know if I have it in my blog post here. It's a very uninformative blog post of mine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um So yeah, um I think that was one of my um uh, you know, I like I thought it'd be someone bigger. Like I thought maybe uh, Polar Instruments for example who make the fan, you know, one of the best uh signal integrity toolkits on the market. You know, because Altium's very lacking. Uh, software, software. Okay, okay. Um, so yeah, because Altium designer is very lacking in signal integrity type mm-hmm. stuff. In fact, their yeah. building stuff pretty much sucks, right? Everyone uses like Polar Instruments. So I thought, you know, that'd be a you know a good thing to buy for yeah. them. I, yeah. well, you know, maybe an auto router that actually works. Um, ah, you know? Never trusted. Never trusted, Dave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> never trust the auto router. That's right. Um, you know, and it's. Anyway, um, yeah, and the obvious, uh, actually, no, because it was a year ago, because they hadn't even um, done the whole circuit maker thing then, so we didn't know about um, Siva and Octopart uh, being the back end. This is why, by the way, for those who don't know, this is why they bought Octopart and this Siva mob. Octopart and Siva are the back end, the entire back end that they're using and database and component library that they're using for circuit maker plus they're probably going to you know integrate it without him designer blah 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 you know well they've so, had a plug-in for for designer too for octopro that's that's oh uh, okay right yeah, I, see, have, I, have... I don't use the latest version right yeah. oh right, right so right, that makes yeah. sense yep oh cool there like I said, so I, that uh, was obvious um, yeah i think i you know, like i said i i know the i know a bunch of the octopart guys they're they're great so i'm uh i'm really glad to see they're going to to a cool company like that so hopefully, I wish them. I wish them well. Um, Bring it on! <laughs> yeah, I hope Altium don't ruin them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, any any merger is tough. I mean, I've been through a merger, yeah, and yeah. Uh, usually there's always you know culture clashes. I, have you been through one ever? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I've been through mergers. Yeah. yeah, it's tough because it's like there's always expectations and a lot of fear, so people are on edge. And if it's Dan or her, you know, usually they're. Well founded right. fears. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you the know. The Danaher like, way, you know, the Danaher yeah, system. Yeah, now right, now right. they're going to Octopart are going to get the Altium system. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but, but they're continuing with Octopart, like as people know it, right? The website search engine, right? So they're continuing with that, aren't they? I, I don't know. I think I the early reports I, were that they were. Yeah, I read Sam's. I mean, you know, we know what the, the blog post says. So Sam wrote a blog post about it so um 
Yeah, I mean, they say they're they're continuing on, so that's good. Cool. Yeah. I don't know if people were expecting more fireworks from us. No, the it's end like is nigh. It, I don't know. It's like a, it's a completely obvious acquisition. Um, I I think there's still another acquisition on the cards with that money because I don't think Octopart were that huge and they would have paid a huge enough amount of money for it. Um, Seaver, I don't know. Um, although we, we, we must find out how much they pay because Altium's a public company. Altium can't keep this quiet. They can't just say, oh, we're, we're not going to tell you. that." <laughs> Do you, you know, know how much they raised for that stuff? I can't remember. Oh, like, I think it was $60 million, but I can't. Oh, wow. Okay. My, don't have it in my, yeah, sorry. Maybe I'll quickly Google it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um. No, sorry, Google's coming to gutsa. That's okay. Uh, anyway. Yeah. So uh, that's cool. Um. Ba ba ba. So I guess that's. So anyway, I think yeah. there's someone else on the cards to be acquired. Okay. Layout you think? Here. You that think maybe more of the more on the the tool side, like the. I uh, the it'll always well hopefully it's always on the tool side rather than the stupid morphic cloud crap and, you know <laughs> FPGAs which they spent ten years acquiring yeah you know, but um, speaking yeah, of uh, FPGAs did you see this article that uh, Hackaday posted I don't know like how groundbreaking it is but which one is this uh well just that there's there's a new Chinese fab that's making FPGAs and I thought really? I thought that was really yeah I thought it was really interesting. But who? Who's the, who's the FPGA company? I've, I've never heard of them, but it was uh, Goin. Well, nobody's going to use a thir- nobody's going to use a no name FPGA. Well, like, yeah, you'd think that, but then they, you know, so Synop- Synopsis is doing the tool chain because at a certain point it comes down to tool chain. For FPGAs, it comes down to no, tool yeah, chain. totally, right? yeah. totally. So and they're hideously complex beasts. Hideously, yeah. they're they're the most complex tool chains on the planet. FPGA tool chains. I don't think that's any exaggeration. Um, I I don't even. <laughs> all I know is that uh, FPGA. Come on, you've, you've use, played around with FPGA no, I, tool chains. I, I, no, I know I have, but all I think is like I know that there's tickle scripts in there, and I know that there's a lot of other stuff tickle I don't scripts? understand. Yeah, TCL. You know what's a TCL? TCL is a programming. It's like a scripting language. Oh uh, right, okay. Yeah, right. yeah. And they're called tickle, and uh, and I know that's not a, a true measure of, of of complexity, but I'm just like I see that. I'm just like, nope. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I mean, and it's not it, the, even under the hood. It, you know, there's tons of processing and stuff like that, and yeah, it's it's nutty. Um, they're insane. They're insane tool sets. So uh, look. And if you've used I if you know. used uh, Actel before, so Actel had so I've used yeah. I've used the uh, I think Synopsis bought Simplify. I think Simplify was a separate company. Maybe not. Maybe it's. Maybe it always was Synopsis. Oh God! Yeah, I can't, I can't remember. They've had more mergers and buyouts. Yeah. And, yeah, lunches. Yeah, <laughs> um, but I've used their stuff before. Actually, I used to use a uh, a Mat. Uh, what's it called? What's the Mat MATLAB uh, little block diagram tool? Shoot. Mat MATLAB block diagram tool. Uh, no. You've got me. MATLAB block diagram. <laughs> Guess what I'm doing? Uh, <laughs> oh, this is pathetic. Yeah. Simulink, sorry. Simulink is, is the Oh, is the Simulink, tool. right. Yeah, yes, right, of right. course. Yeah, so there they, right. uh, when I was doing when I was doing some FPGA stuff back in the day, which was 2004, um uh it was there was there was a couple of different plugins you can get where like basically like Synopsis or you know uh, Simplify had one and then Xilinx had one but basically you drop like these FPGA blocks into Simulink and then you could basically create like these math models and then you know uh right. tweak it and then it would just basically spit out VHDL or Verilog which is great for an idiot like me uh not great <laughs> right. for making maintainable code but so that was no, my no, exactly. exposure to it and and man it's ex- they have some expensive but some fancy tools but they also uh if you've ever used the actel slash now micro semi um tool chain they use uh the simplify right pro um i think place and route stuff so yeah. So I mean, like, so mm. what I'm trying to say is like, legit names. Yeah. What are you trying to say? 
So, well, like a legit name is working on this stuff. I mean, it's not like okay. it's like. Well, that's good, but still, yeah. is anyone still going to trust it? I mean, yeah, the the well, company yeah. uh, by the by the looks of the chip here. I'm looking at the article. It's called Go Win Semi. Yay, Go Win Semiconductor. I'm mm-hmm. going to use Go Win Semi FPGAs. Not. Yeah. Well, like, like, why? No, no, why no, no, would you no, no, make no. the choice? Like, are they? How compelling are they? Well, um, so here's the thing. Compared so like, to the others. So, I mean, like, if you read through the comments, which is, you know, sometimes tough on Hackaday, but pretty mm-hmm. good. So Mike Mike from Mike's Electric Stuff, he actually brought up a good point. Like, you know, like, it could just open up different segments of the market. So we've talked on here about, you know, smaller packages, and he restates that there, that kind of stuff of just, you know, more accessible packages, stuff like that. Just like things I, I've where... I've been fighting for more accessible FPGA packages for 20 years, yeah. Right, exactly. And it's... <laughs> and, and, and that's the thing, though, like... You're not going to win that battle with like a Xilinx or an Altera, but if you've got someone who's serving a lower end right, market okay. that might, you know, like it's all these things sure. where like, you know, like uh, like, like the sure. es- Espressif, the, 80, yeah, yeah. the ESP eighty two sixty six, right? No one would ever think if if you told someone that three four years ago, like, oh well, you're going to use a core that no one really uses anymore, and it's going to have Wi Fi on board, and you're going to use the AT commands to connect to it, and it's going to get popular with you know because it's simply because it's low cost. You say, well, that's stupid, but like so right. many things, you know, like people will do so much to get around just low cost. They'll they'll deal with hardware bugs. They'll they'll, you know, they'll just they'll the, people will develop tools around it. Obviously, yeah, like the expressive stuff. All right, I don't I don't know. It's just the, the history of FPGA shows FPGA startups, you know, coming into the market just. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, mostly fail. I mean, that's it's just, true. Uh, but they usually know. fail because they try and roll their own software. As far as I know, I remember I've seen a couple articles over the years with like EE Times where it's like, "Yep, still none." Like th- that, there's still no number five, right? There's still there's mm. always the Alteras and Xilinx and the Micro Semi slash Actels and Lattice, and then, and then <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, <laughs> it's not there, right? But, uh. It's still, I mean, like, if usually it's because they're these startups trying to do everything, and mm. maybe maybe this is the kind of thing. And then the cost basis is always, you know, if you have to, if you're trying to roll your own silicon and design all your cells and trying to carve out a niche there, you have to, you know, do some weird things. But maybe, maybe we don't need to here, you know? Well, okay. Well, is okay. It uses uh, Simplify Pro, right? As yes. as their tool chain, yeah. right? Yep. Okay, fine and dandy. Is that free? No. You can get a free evaluation. Exactly, right? It's an expensive tool. Right. Yes, that that is very right? true. So this is not this is not a this is not designed for the low end market, right? Uh, you it might can't underestimate be with an expensive tool. How much uh, people steal software in China, or you know, if there's D- deal. All right. You know? Well, yeah. Okay. Right, like, no, I mean, like, I'm, I'm talking Western market here, right? Engineers, right? Right, but this is designed for the Western are, market. Think about how many uh, things. Then, then who's gonna who's gonna go with it? It'll who's gonna start go? in China. Are you gonna trust? Right, it's like nobody ever got fired for buying IBM argument all over again. Right, it's got nobody got nobody ever got fired for using uh, you know Xilinx or Altera. Right, you've got to, as a design engineer. You've got to put your ass on the line and go, oh, I'm going to use this uh, win, happy go, whatever it's bloody called. Um, uh, go, win, go win semi FPGA. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm there. I'm going to stake my professional reputation on that. I'm going to design that in. Like, I don't know, it's man. It's a tough ask. I, I, I agree with that. I, but what, what I'm uh, saying is, like, people pay, if, say, say the tools are 10K. I think they're probably more, but say, say it's 10Ks for, yep. for a license of Simplify Pro. People are paying 10k for Alter- or for um, Altium licenses and stuff like that. Yeah, right? of course. Okay, right? yes, they and, are. And, and if right. you're making if you're making a thing that needs a reconfigurability and you're making a million a year and you can now go from a, you know, I don't I don't know many FPGAs that are less than five bucks. If you can go from a ten dollar FPGA to a okay, two dollar well, FPGA, right? Well, what? fine, okay, but is this all speculation? How much is this FPGA in volume? What's Dude, the compelling I have difference? No, I, I have no See, idea. See, okay. It comes down to the comp- is it compelling enough to people to for design engineers to risk designing it in? Uh, right? pro- probably not because but... there's risk. There, there's also that you know we've talked about this countless times about the uh, support risk 
down the track? Will you be able to buy this Go Win Semi FPGA in 10 years' time? Uh, yeah, I don't think... Okay, so, so imagine now... I, no, I think... So okay, right now, I'll, I'll you tell will, you, the you'll industry never have... I come from, yeah, I would okay. never... They would never... The, you know, the strict industry that I came from, right? Mm-hmm. There and both the military and the strict commercial industry I came from, where where customers demand five, ten year product support times. I, there is no chance in hell I could ever choose a part like this. And what were the what were the volumes like for those things? Oh, you know, tens of thousands, okay, things like sure, that. But sure, we sure. would have to get we would have to get written assurances from the company that they would still support the product in ten years time. You know how difficult that is to get. I uh, go do. win I've semi, done the same gonna, thing. you know. Right. Oh no. yeah, we might be able to get the CEO of Go Win Semi to say, yeah, we'll still sell this in ten no, years' no, no. time you in think China. About it all like, wrong, come though. on. But why? But what the that, thing that, that's is? That's a practical reality of the market that I came no. from. Oh yeah, from your market. But what I'm saying is, imagine yeah. this, right? You right now name a consumer level device that has an FPGA in it, and I think maybe. Like sure. even even For consumer stuff, yeah, Jerry okay. stuff, right? Like even even the uh, the Cast AR, right? That's not going to have FPGA. It's going to have a. Uh, they're switching over to ASICs because you you need to get the cost down. That's enough, right. right. But if you could do an FPGA instead, and it was at the decent price, and you're selling a million of something, and you're saving enough, and it opens up FPGAs in a consumer level market. Yeah, but ah, uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Don't make the mistake of trying to compare FPGAs with ASICs. It's no, not no, no, only no, about no, no, price. No, no. It's also about area and uh, physical size and, most critically, power consumption power. as well. Oh, yeah, power for sure. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And you're right. FPGAs are usually never the, the choice for power. Like, the, you know, a couple of the Actel, like, low-power parts are interesting, but... Um, oh, yeah, right, of course, yeah. Um, yeah, no, 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 you're right. But I, I, when, I, when, I, when I start to think about it, it's, it sounds like, it seems like, okay, say, so imagine you have something where you have a million of something in the, in a, in, you know, you're making a million of something and you need it to be reconfigurable in a year for whatever reason. You know, like, mm. you know, you start to, you know, you talk about risk, you start to remove some of the hardware risk over time because you have reconfigurability. Now, granted, sending out new FPGA images is not a trivial thing for sure. But it's it's something it's different, right? I mean, like, and what it really just gets of course, me going. It's one of the advantages of FPGAs is that you can, you know, it's in the name field programmable <laughs> right. gate array. Right in the you field, you can upgrade <laughs> in the, the gates in the field. Right. <laughs> it's, yeah. Oh goodness! Yeah, no, no, anyway, no. Anyway, what they they're saying here that basically this is an interesting thing because it gives them a home field advantage because they're made in China. So, you know, yes, they could get, you know, a dominant foothold in China. For um, LV, they're talking about LVDS, DSP, and other stuff that FPGAs do quite well, you know. Right. So, yeah, you start to get yeah. parallel um, processing it's, type it's stuff. That's fine. You know, you... But, uh, like, for, okay, that's great. Yeah, they might have a real successful thing. Would I start using Go Win semi FPGAs? <laughs> I, don't, I can't see it, right? Well, um, um, but are that's you just me, right? a lot of and FPGAs in these days, Dave? <laughs> no, but I'm just saying, if I had a project where I had to choose an FPGA... Of course, right, of course. Would I choose this? No, of course not. Uh, of course yeah, I wouldn't. Right. I think that you're right, right? especially with... I'm not, I, I took a look over at the Simplify Pro or the Synopsis site, and I didn't see any like intro tools. They're all like kind of like... Send us an email and we'll quote you the price kind of thing. But um, you you can get a free product evaluation. You can request, sorry, request right, a free right. product evaluation. Right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, this is not. You know, you you can't just download and go. You know, well, you and can't if just I'm download an and FPGA, go with a, no, no, no. You can't just download and go with any FPGA software because you're going to be waiting no, for ten hours. No, but you know what I mean, <laughs> right? No, but you know, but there are free tools, right? Uh, there are free tools which support most of the low end FPGAs, right? So technically, you can yeah. just download them, and assuming you have the knowledge to use the tools, assuming you, can just you go, have a fiber connection, right? You and yeah, no, you know, come on, you know what I mean, <laughs> right? You know what I mean, right? You don't know, have to pay just, anything. You can I'm just, just download to, and go. I'm just uh, right? giving silence. Yeah, no, time. you're clutching. You're yeah. clutching. 
I'm not clutching. Uh, I'm just I'm just saying that <laughs> that Xilinx tools are like 16 gigabytes of downloads. It's ridiculous. They're they're bohemus. Yeah. Well, how how big is Simplify? I don't know. I haven't downloaded it in a decade. You know. Yeah, I haven't I, either. It's been a while. I don't know. So yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah, um, I wonder about this stuff too because like there, you know, there's some kits out there like the uh, Papilio is an interesting kit and stuff like that. And it, and uh, Jack Gassett was over on he was on Embedded FM. Um, it's got to be almost a year ago, I think now. And, you know, I was listening to it, and I and I wonder about it. Obviously, I'm I'm interested in FPGAs, but, you know, some of the stuff it seems like obviously micros are so ubiquitous. I th- I think that there's value in learning about the parallel processing stuff, but I wonder about you know where the line is between like okay, well, this is like an educational thing of like yeah, it's interesting to learn mm. versus actual implementation of of parallel processing and stuff like that. Well, and, well, this is why FPGAs didn't take off the way Altium and others thought they would come to dominate the industry. Yeah. Is because they're, they're still uh, very uh, mostly suitable to niche applications that require, you know, huge parallelism or, whatever, mm-hmm. you, know, or yep. you know, fast multi channel serial interfaces or whatever, you know, decoding, all that sort of jazz. Right, right. I need, you know? I need 38. 38- I squared C ports. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, you would whack in a little FPGA or CPLD or something, right? right of course. Right. They're, yeah. you know. they're the solutions and, to and, extreme problems. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. And and they probably always will be. Um, that's just the nature of the beast. You know, you can't yeah. be dedicated silicon. You know, if you need a, a smart uh, processor to control something, you, you're not going to whack a core in an FPGA. It's just... No. Right, because there's also very IP few costs. people are going to do that. There's, Stuff like yeah, that. There's, few, yeah. there's only there's very little upside to doing that. There's lots of downside. You know, it's just you just use a micro. Right. You know. Right. Right. So well, and, that's and, why and, micros and, dominate almost everything. And and now the um, even even a lot of the FPGAs now have that hard silicon built in. Like that's that's an increasing trend as well. Whether you know they'll slap a you know versus you know generating a memory controller, they'll just have it in there. No, yeah, know. they've got hard cores DDR2, built in. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. DDR three. Most of the new FPGAs have new, you know, ARM cores built in and stuff like that. Oh, oh I meant know? I just meant memory, but yeah, you're right. There are also a bunch of the ARM cores in there too. So that's see, that's the thing. That's you know, the the dream of FPGAs was shattered once they started doing that. Oh, you know, yeah, okay, people are doing this. Oh, we better actually build some hard silicon into FPGAs because we don't want to piss away our FPGA fabric. With a generic CPU, by people, you know, whacking in a, a soft ARM core, we may as well whack in a hard ARM core. Oh, we may as well whack in a hard Ethernet decoder as well. Oh, we right, may as well yeah. whack in a, you know, a hard, you know, serial interface. Blah blah blah. Yeah. You know. Well, and uh, apparently that's just, one of the things that the uh, the PSOC does pretty well, where it's it is that you know kind of everything in the kitchen sink, but then also there's some recon- reconfigurable fabric and stuff like that. I, I keep hearing good things about the. PSOC 5, PSOC 4, stuff like that. So I, I, they've, I've they've, yet to try they've got it. analog stuff on there as well. Yeah, I'm always pretty weary, weary about that. You know, yeah, like, they're, yeah, it's pretty ordinary performance. Yeah, generally. I mean, yeah, it's it's like if if you're in a pinch, that kind of stuff. Like, and and, and usually the ADCs on on board silicon like that is usually you know they're you know you can get 12 bits pretty standard, um, mm. but you're not going to get great linearity. You're not going to get great, you know, like performance at the the low the low bit the bit side of things so so hey, yeah the future out of fruits up to 33 million bucks i saw that a that's year, very business. impressive yeah yeah it's pretty good oh well you know yeah it's been a slow climb because last time we sort of talked about that it was they were at the 10 million point they're at the 10 million dollar a year sales i think okay no when, no when no no that? no no that was spark <laughs> fun i think out of fruit were at a million or something anyway um, when was yeah. it? <laughs> no, it's, uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Right. But yeah, uh, yeah, no, because uh, there was a presentation at like the Open Hardware Summit or something, was it? Mm. I think that uh, about different, you know, there was, you know, uh, you know, open source hardware companies, you know, were still coming up. Spark Fun was like number one or something, you know, at, at 10 million. I think Artifruit were a couple of million bucks turnover and things like that. Hmm. So, geez, that that must have been yeah. That was probably like four years ago, five years ago. Well, still, like that's, that. I, th- I think that's great yeah. growth. I mean, that's that's 
Yeah, no, no, it's awesome. It's yeah. a hell of a lot more than I'll ever do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. And it, I mean, it sounds like a lot, but it's, you know, when you're... Um, uh, no, no, know, Dave, like, it is, oh, it is no. a lot. It's a lot. Of, they're moving oh, yeah, a lot no, of product. It's a lot. No, but even small... Yeah, but okay, as a comparison, right, it's not that hard for a one or two man band operation to turn over a million dollars a year selling product. It's not hard. Okay. I was listening to a thing the other day though that said uh every time what were they saying? When you go from one to three people, that's a total shift in, in, in culture of your company. When you go from three to ten people, it's a total shift in your culture of your company. Right. Including in you know, because your cost structure changes, everything like that. So I think oh, it, everything changes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Everything changes. So I don't I don't think that, you know, using I, I agree, I, I know people that we might be thinking of the same people that are are doing that kind of you know million dollar uh, revenue stuff, but I think scale wise, you know, that's it's more than you think to get to that you know these these doublings and stuff like that. So I think I, I'm I'm very yeah, but uh, by this. yes, so am I. But they've got uh, how many? Uh, they've they've got eighty five employees now. Okay, there you go. So they're a thirty three million dollar a year company with eighty five employees, but. You know, which which is interesting because, as I said, you can. I actually know almost one. You know that you know sub three people companies. You know, uh, turning over a couple of million bucks a year in sales. You know, it's not hard. You know, if you're, it depends on the margin of your business, right? The Artifruit one is, um, it well, it's probably high margin, but they've got to sell a lot of products because they're not high value products. Right, they I don't know, their their average sale might be thirty, forty bucks or something, right? And uh so they've got to sell a lot of stuff, they've got to ship a lot, a lot of volume to get that thirty three million bucks. Whereas somebody want a couple of person operation to, you know, earn a couple of million bucks a year in, in, in sales, um, you know, if they're making, you know, a hundred bucks profit on each one, you know, or sorry, so if they're selling high value products that are worth, you know, three hundred bucks a pop, you don't have to sell that many to turn over a couple of million bucks. So, you know. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting. Well I don't know. Where's I that won't going? be doing Nowhere. any thirty three million dollar companies anytime soon, so <laughs> anyway, this is a business insider article. Um but yeah, the 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 highlight of it was well, the title is how one woman turned her passion for tinkering into a thirty-three million dollar business without a dime of funding, and that's the that's the novel thing these days, right? To not do it without any funding at all, to bootstrap the thing, right? Right, and and that's where it's coming because nobody bootstraps anymore, which I we've talked about a lot, and I think it's a shame. Everyone wants the quick get rich quick crowdfunding viral bloody you know thing right to happen they want to go on kickstarter and they're suddenly a 10 million dollar company woohoo <laughs> you know like yeah. bu- like bullshit you know buy parts for you know save up a bit of pocket money buy you know don't drink 20 coffees a day just save up some money or beers buy, you know um, yeah or beers buy a hundred uh, uh, kits worth of parts sell your hundred kits make your make you know I don't know, a few grand on it, use that few grand to buy more parts and then more and then more and you bootstrap it that way and it takes time. But, you know, everyone's just trying to get funding quick these days. It's just, in fact, you know, a lot of like graduates who come out, they think that's the only way that you can start a business, it seems like. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what it seems like to me. Every you know, Oh, we have to go on the venture capital thing right we've got to go do the dog and pony show to all the venture capital firms and get our funding or we have to do a kickstarter or we have to do this or that well i think some of that stuff seems glamorous too you know but Uh, it's yeah totally i don't know i don't know if it just seems like the only way today and i'm sick of it because i'm a fan of bootstrapping you know yeah and the good thing about it is it's a zero risk way of doing it too you know you can't lose like you know, you can't lose if you operate at, you know, if you start with no debt, right? Or, or you say, you know, you have to do that initial. You've got to buy, you know, 100 kits or 50 kits or whatever. So you've got to put the money up. And if they don't sell, well, okay, you've lost your money, right? right but assuming right, yep, that yep, you can yep. sell 50 or whatever, you might start out with 10, right? So you might risk $1,000, for example. And, you Which know. Which is a lot when you start out, okay. right? I mean, like, that's no, a lot. It, yeah. it certainly, certainly yeah. can be, you know. But you can even start out smaller than that. 
if you want. And, you know, and then just keep doing it. And then if you've got low overheads and you just keep making a profit on each sale, you're a one-man band, you're a midnight engineer, then, you know, you can't fail. Right. Financially, Worst, anyway. Right, right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. You, you, you can case. fail by the sales dry up, et cetera, but, you know. Right. You're on the ramen diet. You're you're eating right. hot dogs and oranges. <laughs> well, no, it's always... <laughs> well, yeah, the, the, the problem with it, though, is that, you know, you're always um, one production run away from failure. Right, because I, you know, right, you've got to, right, I've sold my product. Okay, like I'm, I'm out of stock. Okay, I've got to get another thousand manufactured. Okay, so you've got to put up that dosh for a thousand units, right? Mm-hmm. And if all of a sudden your sales vanish, then you're left holding the bag with a thousand units, right? So you've got to, you know, but, yeah, the, right but, right. but the history of all your sales pretty much guarantees that you, you know, you're going to have a hard time failing. So, you're saying because because you've already proven to the point where you could sell because you've already proven that there's 10. a consistent chain. Yeah, yeah. You, you're going to sell five, ten a week, or whatever. You know, like it, it's totally consistent. Yeah, and and you can measure that, and you know, it's unla- you know, Statistics works once you have enough people. Statistics works. That's how I can make money from uh, ads. You know, yeah. Uh, in theory, all of my ad revenue can dry up tomorrow, and I'm out of business, right? But yeah statistically i know that is ridiculously improbable you know that that would happen that everyone would pull their advertising at once you know right like, right 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 yeah you know so it's it's fairly consistent so and mm. if i get enough views on youtube you know i might get okay i get x thousand per month in ad revenue right from you know youtube and you know yeah and that'll vary from month to month Right, but I know I can pretty much guarantee that's not going to drop to zero. Right, it is. You know, there's just so many people searching for videos and watching that. You know, the sheer statistics of it pretty much guarantees it. Yeah, no. So it's yeah, great. No, that's good. it's great that there's there's people out there searching for stuff. So yeah, but yeah, I kind of feel disappointed that there has to be an article like this without a dime of funding, as if it's the most novel thing ever oh my god somebody started a business and got no funding oh how do you do that it's a miracle right no it's called bootstrapping it's been done for bloody well thousands yeah, but of I years think i'm so, sure i mean so now that i'm in the web world a little bit more too it's like it, like the default assumption is you're not selling anything you're you know just giving everything away to start with you know and so i think that's one of the big differences too so huh how are you giving everything away to start with on the web like so, like startups. A lot of the startup world is like, oh, so we're gonna have this free app, and then eventually we'll figure out how we're gonna make money, right? Well, you, well, you can't do that with hardware. Like, well, of course, know, that's very what I'm few saying. companies go, oh, okay, I'm gonna give you a free <laughs> widget, right? And then I'll figure out how to make money. No, right? Mm. No, no, I don't. I, please I, don't I, fuddle up the <laughs> software with hardware. Ugh. No, no. Well, that's what I'm saying, though. I think that's where the expectation comes from, where it's like, oh, I can't believe they. They didn't raise money because every right. startup has to in order every software startup has to in order to survive. There's there's no one that there's very few that are like, well, we're going out and charging money for the software that's not proven yet. You know what I mean? That's that's the big difference. No, oh, I don't know. I don't like the software analogies. Okay. Not a fan. Sorry. It's okay. You're not hmm. the one making them. It's it's all these <laughs> journalists that are making them. So I think that's. I'm just trying to explain what's going on here, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness yeah yeah anyway awesome yes i wonder how much spark fun are worth these days because spark fun was always bigger than artifruit so if artifruit are 33 million have they like caught it did spark fun plateau and artifruit have caught up or have spark fun like 300 million because spark fun was always like an order of magnitude bigger than artifruit kind of thing that's how i, I always i don't really i didn't really in terms of sales yeah mm, anyway Yep. I'm glad as long as they're all increasing still. That's good. That's good news for us. People still give a shit about electronics. <laughs> that's good news for us. <laughs> uh. I wonder how she handles running a a business that big now. 85 employees. That that's starting to get to the point where if you were the original founder, you may not actually know everyone who's been hired in the company. 
Yeah, that's right. I'm sure she does. Like I'm, I'm sure she does. But it's almost getting to you know, almost getting to that point where, you know, people could be hired and you could be the original founder and you would not, you wouldn't have been involved in that hiring decision and you right. wouldn't have met them or you might right. run into them on on the production line. You know, who are you? <laughs> right. Kind right. Exactly. So, yeah. No. No. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. And, and that that's. I just remember it was the it was a. Oh, I forget who it was actually was, but it was on a Tim Ferriss podcast that was talking about. He was interviewing someone who was talking about that that thirty to a hundred, hundred to three hundred, three hundred to a thousand, and right. and that same guy was saying that I think that the there's some like there's some law out there that like once you get past like 150 people some in an law. office, not law, but you know it's like a, it's like a <laughs> yeah. I, <don't. laughs> I think it might have been Richard Branson or something like that. But once you get past like 150 people in an office, you just it's literally impossible to know everyone. Whatever. The, yeah, 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 that number can't. is. Yeah. I think it's based on social networks and stuff like that too. You just literally can't keep maintain that many oh, social connections. Ba- yeah, yeah, it's ba- ba- yeah based on a lot of um, God- uh, psych- Godin's uh, law, not, not Godwin's psychology, law? but social. Yeah, something like that. Social research has gone into. Yeah, you can't have more than like a hundred and fifty personal friends or something. It's just like you can't maintain that many personal relationships. It's you know part of the human blah, whatever. In yeah, I think it's, it social Godwin's, psychology yeah, term Godwin's here. law. Godwin's uh, law? I think so. I'm trying. I'm looking at this stupid, <laughs> stupid page. <laughs> oh no, that's a different one. I'm sorry. That's terrible. No, yeah, Godwin, of course no, it is. Not, I thought it was. It's not. It's not it's, this. <laughs> Godwin's law is the Hitler thing. <laughs> it's the as long. <laughs> sorry. If we do the, the uh, we we just did it. We we, we, we just, just did, did it. it. Yeah, you're right. if, if you if you do this show long enough, we're going to mention Hitler. That's right. Yeah, yeah. the yeah, probability the probability that a discussion yeah. will devolve to talking about Hitler. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> self fulfilling. <laughs> so yep, Godwin's law fulfilled again. Yep. <laughs> Works every time. <laughs> yep. Dunbar's now, number. Now that's, let's that's see the, the comment. One. Now let's see the comments oh, in the AFL yeah. page. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's... I, I give it ten posts before it reaches <laughs> before someone does don't, a comparison. No, with don't Hitler. don't do that. Don't do that. It was it's <laughs> it's Dunbar's number. That's what it is. Dunbar's Dunbar, number. Dunbar. Ah, yes, yeah. right. Yeah. Sorry. Oh dear, Eddie. <laughs> uh. Suggested cognitive limit. Dunbar's yeah. number is a suggested cognitive limit. Here's the educational part of the show, folks. Yeah, Dave suggested reading Wikipedia. Suggested cognitive <laughs> limit to the, yeah, to, the number, the, to the number of people who one can maintain stable social relationships. Okay, so what is the figure? Between 100 and 250. Yeah. It lies depending on your social capacity. If you're a social right. butterfly like uh, Mr. Gamble here, then uh, oh, yeah. you're going to be upwards of 250. My, yeah. Me alone in my hotel room drinking a beer, talking to a crazy Aussie halfway across the world yeah, over I, a <laughs> shitty connection. Yeah, yeah you're right. I, you're right. I, Super I don't social. think I could reach double digits, let alone triple. So, <laughs> mm. Anyway, there you I go. I do Dunbar's wonder about that. Like, you have 150 people in office. Who talks to everyone in their office? Come on! Like, <laughs> no, 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 exactly. No, there's some no. Like you, you don't talk to marketing even, people. Even it's if you had fifty, not done. even if you had fifty people in your office, who's going to talk to everybody in that office? I don't know. Yeah, no, it's just no. <laughs> no work would get done. You know, yeah. it's just everyone forms their little social groups, and that's it. You know, you generally just yeah. No, it's just the way it is. Smart companies, I guess, like at lunchtime. Maybe if you're a smart company, here we go, isn't something I've never encountered, probably a good reason why, is that, you know, if it was company policy, you would, you know, you turn up for lunch, you know, you go to the canteen or whatever you have, mm-hmm. where everyone eats, right? Well, most people eat. Nerds generally just eat at their desk or bench. Yes, you know? they definitely anyway, just, if, <laughs> they just eat at their desk, yes, I, I know that if, one. If it was company policy, right, that everyone had to go to lunch and you you came in and you were, you checked the chart and here's your chart of the table you're sitting at today and it, you know, it's like a wedding, you know, like you have to, <laughs> oh God, we've invited all of these, uh, this side of the family, this, uh, these people, who knows who whose compatible personalities do we put together and, you know, and seat at the tables together. You know, so you're saying all, you have to sort of you jazz. have to like literally force force the nerds together kind of thing. You would you would have to force them together, but I wonder if that would be a good company approach so that you know everyone gets to know everyone. So, I wonder how successful that would be. Does so does anyone before, work for a company like that or know of a company that? Well, so has, so here's, here's my reference policy. point. Here's my reference point. Maybe it's the same in Australia, but 
I was literally shot not not this time when I came out here, but now that I work in California once in a while. But the first time I came to California and started doing some consulting work, and I was literally shocked that they had food in the offices, like just for like general consumption. Now I know that, but like the reason being that like hmm. that never happened. You know, it was always like, yeah, bring your own stuff, right. pay for your own coffee, that kind of thing. And I'm not mm-hmm. sure if that's an Ohio thing or a Midwest thing or just a no, no, hardware that, thing. it's no, it's a, it's a sil- It never used to be here. It's a total Silicon Valley culture thing, right. and that made its way to Australia. Altium, for example, Altium had a first class, fully catered can- oh, canteen, yeah, you breakfast, used to lunch, that. and I dinner. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You were always happy when it was hamburger dinner. day, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Friday was hamburger day, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, yeah. <laughs> I, I, th- I think that was probably the only day that I made an appearance up in the canteen, actually, because I right. generally, you know, because the wife generally made my own lunch, you know. And the, right, right. Even the, though the Altium was pretty darn good, it wasn't good the enough. The healthy yet. Joneses, yes, so, right. Eating right. all organic and yep. everything. Yeah. <laughs> oh well, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd go up there and get a muffin and stuff, you know. Right. So Bad boy me. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> but yeah, no, and, yeah, and, no, that, and the idea behind entirely, that is to, to get people yeah. to eating together and stick yes, around to work and stuff yep. like that. Yeah. It yeah. totally comes from like this software startup culture. Um, I, I, You know, it's in the very early software internet startups all right, did right. that. You well, know, a lot of people very, don't realize that like yeah. the reason the perks at all these companies are so great is like, they want you there as long as they can get you. you yeah, know? I know. <laughs> like, exactly. If you're a... Yeah, if you're a young, that was the Altium, right? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? If you're a a young single person, right? They encourage you to practically live there. Yeah, exactly. You know? So what what the hell are you going to do? I mean, just work some more, right? You know, yes. if you're getting free breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right, catered for, and plus other perks as well, and you're a young single person struggling to save money, you're damn right you're going to go eat your free breakfast, lunch, and dinner there. Yeah, you would, right? but I, I wonder about that, like like. I don't know about you, but like, like we you know we're talking work culture here. Like, any time I've been in a job, like some of my jobs have had some pretty crazy expectations in terms of work hours, but never like expectations formal? in terms of formal expectations. Never, they were never allowed to be formal. Or never formal. It was all informal, no, right? Pe- yeah, you work peer... thirty-eight hours a week, right? Yeah, a peer-based, right? Yeah. yeah. Wait, what? You work thirty-eight hours a week? <laughs> What? That's a standard. That's a standard here in Australia. Was it thirty-seven or the, yeah, thirty-eight hours a week? It's the standard working week here in Australia. I guess Why? forty is is the 40 standard. Is it in but the US? I don't know, man. I've had I've had. Ex- I'm sure that like I'll I'll have people that agree with me, but like you would get like weird looks if you build less if you put down less than fifty hours in your timesheet. Like first off, I hate timesheets. I am ne- oh. I'm never. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. If if <laughs> you could take you could cut my salary in half and no, that's not true. But you know, like like that that is one I've, thing I will never miss about about a, a regular job. So that's and is you talk about uh, cutting it in half, right? I know people who would actually negotiate with the company, right, to work less hours. And I've always said this myself, right? Mm-hmm. If if I could work less hours a week and accept less pay, I would take it. Yeah. Right. Because I, you know, I I never needed every last cent, right? I was very good at saving, so I never le- needed every last cent. So I would have worked less hours. And I know a lot of people who've done that in the company. They've gone and said, "Look, I'd like to work four days a week instead of five, or whatever," and and take you know less pay as well. You know, so they're not asking for more pay, exactly the same pay, but you know they yeah. only get paid for the four days. And then come review time, they go, "Well, you're not working five days a week like everyone else." What are you doing? <laughs> and, and they go, but I'm only paid to work four days a week. And, well, no, your your right. your your attitude is poor, you know. And they would right. actually rate them down, even though they agreed to it. And that's the when you become a consultant and you triple your oh, rate and you just, work whenever yeah, you want right. to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and seriously, that is that's the choice. And I had to do that too when I tried to go part time when I was switching over to my. Oh, of course my you current. did. That. I remember that. I remember the day, folks. He came in. And, oh yeah! Uh, oh, Dave, oh, this is yeah, this is where Dave says, "I told you so again." I, I'm going to tell the story. This. I can yeah. remember. I it was in the morning. You were still working at a. Oh, well, yeah, 
It was some ABB. Some People know. It's fine. It, it, it's ABB. It was, it was an ABB, right? Anyway, yeah, it's no secret. You know, you right. didn't leave I've on talked, bad terms. I've talked about it. Right? No, I've talked about it. It's fine. No, it's and, good. Yeah, no, it's fine. Okay, so you were at ABB, and I remember you were. Were, were we talking or were we just chatting? I can't. I think remember. we were chatting. Anyway. Yeah, we were talking we're, online because we I was. I was really nervous about yeah. it. I was going to ask. Yeah, to go you were part-time. really nervous. You were going. Yeah, he was going to go in because you know the whole um, uh, contextual electronics thing. You wanted to do that, and. So he, you know, he was about to go in. Yeah, I remember. You were really nervous. I'm going to, you know, Chris said, oh, I'm going to go in and I'm going to ask if I can work part-time. And I went, <laughs> they're never going to do it. Dude, they're just going to boot you straight out the door. They're going to say no, work didn't. full-time or leave. And Chris went, no, no, no. I, th- I think they'll be happy with it. I think they'll be okay. And then a couple of hours later, he came, I was waiting <laughs> to yeah. say I told you so. And a couple of hours later, Chris came back online and went, Yep, you're right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, Dave's always I'm so gone. supporting. <laughs> I'm so gone. So support. No, it wasn't like that though. It was like it was like I had said to choose, and at that point, I was I was ready. Yeah, they, I was they prepared. They gave you an to, ultimatum, to, exactly yeah, like I said. And I was prepared to go, yeah. and I was like, okay, well, that's it then, and that's fine. And uh, yep. yeah, but yep. no, and it comes down to that where it's like, and it's not, it's not that that actually wasn't the company I was talking about, but. You know, like just these expectations around, like ABB was actually really good about about a lot of this stuff. But like, you know, expectations around billing and you know, like hours you're putting in, stuff like that. Like how late people mm-hmm. stay there. It's you know, you think, oh well, I'm not going to do it, but you know, it's a it's a powerful that peer pressure is very very powerful. Oh and, yeah, totally. And yeah. it's you know, especially if it's like, hey, look, we got stuff to do here. You really shouldn't be going home right now, and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, and like you don't want to like let your coworkers down either. So, but no, that's right. That can only yeah. go on for so long, and then you start to get really weary of it. So, I I I never felt pressure to let you know, like letting the company down. I never really cared about the company coworkers. Yes, yeah, of you course. know, like I yep. I didn't want to leave them. Hot, you know, it's Friday afternoon and all hell's broken loose on the production line. You know, it's four thirty. On a Friday, all hell is broken loose. You know, I'm not going to secretly sl- sneak out the back door while my mates are holding the bag. Right. You know exactly, exactly. And Big, that's you know if if they're left holding the bag, I'll stay there and hold the bag with them. But if we all <laughs> manage to sneak out, then that's fine. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's go, let's go quick, all of us. <laughs> you know, right. that was done more than once. Yeah, I've talked so, to some. I've talked yeah, to someone where they said they said it was like a Friday and they had sent out a uh, one day turn on a thursday night and right. then the board shows up at like <laughs> yeah, seven, friday after. seven yeah. or eight p.m on friday because people are waiting on around friday. for it <laughs> and they're like all right the board's here and it's like okay yeah. we can go home now right it's like no no it's time to troubleshoot it's like oh shit yep. <laughs> you know like <laughs> yeah been like, there. and you know and like a lot of that some people thrive on that and you know yeah and, oh, like, totally yeah i enjoy it sometimes I, and especially I, if I enjoyed I'm, it sometimes not always you know yeah right like now yeah. i'm sure that you you know now that you have family too like it's like like i've seen coworkers like calling their kids being like i'm missing your baseball game it's like man that's heartbreaking you know like yeah, that kind yeah, of thing that's, yeah yeah i don't know it's and, and and it's it's always a confluence of factors it's usually like scheduling around projects and you know and just, there's right. just there's a ton of stuff there but hmm yeah working for a living <laughs> the moral of the story is don't work for the man, folks. Right, right. Choose which 16 hours are you work per day. <laughs> yes, exactly. You can work any 16 hours a day you like. That's right, right, right. <laughs> but you know what? It's so much Be easier to boss. go do chores at 10 in the morning and then work the rest of the day. <laughs> work till 3 in the morning. <laughs> Speaking of which, I have to go now because I've got to finish oh, a video. you got to go afternoon. finish a video, yeah. I'm going to go, well, I have to, well, not even finish I've got to go start it and finish it, hopefully. Oh, oh yeah. So yeah. What, what Dave's really saying here is he spent all morning on the forums. That's what I'm really hearing. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah. yeah. Mm, well, no, I, kinda, I, ha- I half set it up. I did set it up. I did something. I did uh-huh. a token effort. Okay. okay. And then, you know, I can't stay back because I've got to go to the gym at 5.30 and I feel bad if I can't leave it. 5.30 oh, and miss the gym. So Dave's, screw it, Dave's, you know. Dave's a gym rat. That's right. Why. Yeah, got to get out of there. Good. That's yeah. healthy. Well, Dave's a healthy person. People should yeah, follow his example. I don't get example. to go to it much these days, you know. But yeah, yeah no, I don't want to feel like this. there's so much pressure in this job that I can't do that. That sucks, you know. Right, that means so, you're, not, you're not designing the job right. Yeah, exactly. Cool, right. man. Well, so I'm glad it. 
I'm glad that this sort of worked. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how the edit lines up. It did. Up, but... I'm surprised it held up for an hour. Yeah. Yeah. So shocked. Does this mean that you're going to get like a ten thousand dollar phone bill? <laughs> no, I'm unlimited, quote oh. unquote. Remember, so. I can remember a quick, a quick story when we went to China um, uh-huh. for production for a company that shall remain nameless. Um, yeah, are we of course the Chinese internet and you know, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Anyway, yep, we yep. needed internet on the production floor. And we needed it for a week, and um, yeah, we had to use a phone. Had to use a phone. And then the next oh month, the God. bill came in, and it was like $10,000. Holy shit. I'm not kidding. And they just went, yep. Well, cost Sign of doing off. business, right? You know? Yep, exactly. Cost of doing business, yep. Oh, man, that, that's like that's like the magic <laughs> yeah. wand. You can say that, yeah, and people yeah. are like, oh, yeah, what are you going to do? Yep. Oh, Dave Jones charges $3,000 an hour. Cost of doing business. Had to pay him to do <laughs> that it. ridiculous video. <laughs> cost of doing business. <laughs> Uh, alright man alright talk to you next week catch you next time